Welcome to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host for today, David Lapp, co-founder of Braver Angels. I'm joined today by two guests, two Braver Angels veteran members, one red and one blue, to talk about their reactions to President Biden's inauguration, their thoughts on unity, and what it will take to avoid a civic divorce with each other. Greg Smith, he lives in Waynesville, Ohio. He's a red. Uh, he lives in Waynesville for part of the year and the other part in Ellerton, Florida, where he is right now. Greg is a former police chief and a retired asphalt technician, but perhaps most spectacularly for our purposes right now, he is one of the stars of the Braver Angels documentary. He was a participant in the second ever Braver Angels workshop, and he's a founding co-chair of the first ever Braver Angels Alliance. And Greg is a, is a dear friend. And I met Greg in April of 2017 at that second ever Braver Angels workshop. Then later in the summer on what was then the Better Angels bus tour, uh, we were in Nashville and I had the privilege of meeting our other guest, Sage Snyder. And Sage is a performer, songwriter, and music historian based in Nashville, where she performs with artists across the political spectrum. She began bringing arts and politics together by designing, uh, of course, Music and Democracy in Ancient Greece, a program at the Yale University Art, and Gallery, Art, Yale University Art Gallery. And then she later ran a Civil War music program for the Smithsonian of American History. She was the founding director of cultural engagement for Braver Angels and today is a busy law student at Vanderbilt University and also a wonderful friend. So welcome to you both, Sage and Greg, welcome. Thanks, Thanks for you, having David. us. Thank you. And we are here today because what provoked this conversation was the day after President Biden's inauguration, Greg, you wrote a very heartfelt and passionate Facebook post uh, what was on your, about what was on your heart and mind about our country. And we talked on the phone and, and then we said, well, let's, let's talk more about this. And, and you said, let's bring Sage into this conversation as well. And, um, and you and Sage have a friendship and we have a friendship uh, going back several years now. And so we're gonna, we should just say, right, acknowledge that what we're gonna talk about today about how you both are feeling about the country, these things that we're talking about are things that make for a lot of tense conversations normally on social media and at workplaces and in living rooms across the country. So, and I'm sure this conversation will become passionate and, and, and maybe even tense at moments, but I, I, I'm comforted by the fact that we embark on this conversation uh, within the bond of friendship. And so I think that's just, that's just everything. So in that spirit, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's embark on this conversation together. So Greg, um, uh, well, actually Sage, let's start with you. Uh, how do you two know each other? Give us a little bit of a, a backstory here. Well, we've been friends for a few years, all through Braver Angels. Um, and I think that what ties us together is music. So we met a few years ago at the Braver Angels first convention. And I met Greg through his daughter, who is a very talented singer, Ronnie Lynn Smith. And I was supposed to perform a song with her. She was a far better singer than me. So we were working on, um, I was adding some harmony to her parts. And then we performed uh, in a concert together. And I just got a chance to, to know her and her spirit. And she's an amazing person. And through playing music together, we started talking politics. And I also met her father, who is a very proud father of his very talented daughter. Um, but actually, Greg was also very supportive of my music. And, it, you know, I, I play a type of music where I don't always get a lot of support from my friends and family for the type of music that I play. So whenever I can find somebody who really 
cares about what I do. It's really important to me. And Greg has been a huge supporter and somebody I could talk to about uh, being a musician. And um, I've continued a relationship uh, talking politics and music with his daughter for years now and, and also with Greg. And Greg, any, anything you want to add to that about how you two know each other? Uh, she says it well. Um, we met for the first time at our first convention, and but I didn't get to know her a whole lot because Ronnie Lynn was, uh, she became ill and was not able to uh, perform at that show. And, um, and then she went into, uh, she went into some tough times with some illnesses and that. And then uh, what I noticed about Sage all the way through that uh, up until recently that she was very supportive of Ronnie Lynn, including her into some important things, uh, musical aspects of Very Ver Angels and, and helping to judge music and, and songwriting and, and other talents. And uh, so I just observed her, but I think where I really fell in love with uh, the musician Sage Snyder was when we held our, um, I called it the big event, where we had uh, Sage came in, we had Richard Lynch band, we had Peter Yarrow, we had uh, Ronnie Lynn. Um, I think that's all that we had for performance that day. But um, Sage, she pulled off a feat that I've never seen done. She has mastered both the violin and the fiddle. And <laughs> people that know music understand what I mean when I say that, because she played with Richard Lynch and she played, uh, uh, among other things, the Orange Blossom Special. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen Richard Lynch band. I mean, they're a good band. They're real good. Richard's a good songwriter, a good performer, and all that stuff in his own right for classic country and all that. And that's why I just said classic country. And then Sage gets on the stage with them, and she plays... Um, orange blossom special and the band came alive i think it turned into about a 10 or 15 minute song if you remember that sage <laughs> and, uh, on the same stage on the same day peter yarrow had asked my daughter to sing a song specifically wanted her to sing uh 500 miles and also wanted her to sing jet airplane and the reason for that is uh peter yarrow says that those two songs are very special to him and reminds him of singing with Mary. And he specifically wanted Ronnie to sing those songs for that reason. And there's a little story I have to tell because it's very fun. Uh, so I get on the, the phone and I call Peter. I said, Peter, I found a version of 500 Miles and uh, that they did, they made it a hit. And I said, and it's, it's done by Justin Timberlake of all people. And I'm like, he's not country, but it also has a violin part. So she just played the fiddle. Now I got this violin thing. I'm like, she's a, she's a musician. She'll be able to do this. I said, why don't we? He said, well, send it to me, Greg. So I sent it to him. He calls me back. And it, it, it's really cool because Peter calls me and his words on the phone was, Greg Smith, you're a musical genius. I said, <laughs> no, I'm not. He said, where did you find that? And I said, YouTube. Everybody can find it. Anybody can find it. Anyway, long story short. We uh, asked Sage if she would play that violin part in a ballad, basically, uh, to back up Ronnie and Peter. And, and I, think, I think you did, did you do harmonies on that, Sage? I think so. I think you did some harmonies too. So that's where I fell in love with the musician, uh, Sage Snyder. And, and it just, it was like, it, was, it went full circle. It went all the way from something near bluegrass all the way up to, the ballad, you know, kind of a bluesy ballad, I guess, but it was beautiful. Then, then I got to know the person a little bit better when, when she was uh, working with Ronnie, they wrote a song that I've had different musicians, professional musicians have heard this song and, uh, and they wrote a song together. And I've been told by numerous people that are in the industry that tells me that's a hit. And whatever, and I, I passed that song on to a country and Western guy that's in the top 10 right now um, through a friend, a mutual friend that I just met. And uh, I, just, I just tell you, I don't know. Between, you put her and Ronnie Lynn in a room together and you're going to get some magic out of that. I, I believe that with all my heart. Harmony. There's I, harmony I, there. 
it's yeah. beautiful honey it's harmonious in all ways it's harmonious yeah. in every, every aspect so well that's a that's a good segue into uh this next part of our conversation harmony because you know a lot of the country we're not experiencing harmony with each other right and um so let's let's dive into that so greg uh as I mentioned, on the day after President Biden's inauguration, you wrote uh, a Facebook post that provoked this conversation. So let me just read that. Uh, and then I wanna ask you uh, to share about what led you to write it. So here's the Facebook post from Greg Smith. Enough is enough, stop it now. To my friends and colleagues, hold yourself and our elected officials accountable and tell them, don't ask them, demand them to stop labeling me and my like-minded friends as racist and white supremacists just because we vote for a man that you love to hate. It's not cute, it's not accurate, and it's not what Braver Angels was founded on. As you've heard me say many times before, be the light and get your kids. Although I've been labeled a racist and a white supremacist by our new president, Joe Biden's administration, and the people who I refer to as the Democrat state-run media, I'm still going to pray for our new administration. You all know I love you, but this has to stop. God has blessed America. It's time we bless God by striving for unity, dignity, and brotherly love. Stop the racism. And then you have a love sign U.S. So, Greg, what led you to write that? Well, uh, I, it, was, it was after the inauguration and all the, uh, the news outlets, uh, they're commonly known as the mainstream uh, news media. Uh, of course, I have my own name because I just believe they're just totally partial. I don't think they report accurately often. But... Um, in that all day long, I just kept hearing uh, politician after politician and news media persons uh, referring to, and, and they were referring because of the, uh, the, the, the sixth, the Capitol attack, okay, which to this date, there's still no facts. The facts have not been released. We still don't know who did what. And all, so we don't, the facts, I'm a, I'm a police officer and, and you have to wait on facts. All the facts have to come in. There has to be a full investigation. So there's going to be things come out, and and if it's uh, if it's like the the media saying that it that it that they're Donald Trump supporters, well then I call it the fringe. Kuyar and I, we both, you know, Kuyar and I in our relationship, uh, you'll have fringe on the left and fringe on the right, and you just basically have to ignore the fringe, and you have to uh, to bring the like-minded people in the center, and 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 cooperate and get along. But they kept referring to me and Donald Trump supporters and Donald Trump himself as racist and white supremacists. And, and it just isn't so. And, and it's sad. And, and I've been called names all my life. I've been, I mean, when you're a cop, you get called some good names, but, uh, or bad names, however you want to put it. But um, I'm not, a, I, it does, I'm not, I'm not thin skinned. I can handle it. What hurts me deeply is you're talking about my daughter my son, who, which, by the way, probably voted for Biden, and I'm OK with that because he's allowed to do what he wants to do. Um, and then I have my other daughter, uh, Ronnie Lynn, that we spoke of, and, and I have grandchildren. And I don't my grandchildren, we're all a diverse family. We're all um, we love everyone. You know, uh, most of us are Christians and we are not racists. We are not the white supremacists. We're not any of that. None of us are. And I can speak for my family. And then I can probably speak for a lot of the families that I know that I grew up with. And, and I'm sure there, I mean, I know I've seen racist acts in my life, but they're so rare, far and few between. And when it just this, this keeps on going on and it's still going on. And now it's went even to a further thing. Uh, it's went on further now to where they're even uh, accusing um, us all and especially even Congress and Senate, that that they're uh, that they attempted murder, they attempted murder. No, none of that stuff is true. And and I haven't heard Donald Trump say one thing. I have not heard the president say one thing uh, that would incite 
riots from like-minded, good, decent people. You'll have crazy people on the left. You'll have crazy people on the right. And I have heard, um, I've actually heard the people on the left, uh, politicians on the left that have said things that could incite, specifically telling them to get in somebody's face, to kick them when they're down and all that kind of thing. But I'm just going to stand firm on that. Uh, and speaking on behalf of Trump supporters everywhere, real Trump supporters, what, a million at least? Some people say two million, but definitely hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people there. And you had uh, a, a group of, I'm going to guess, a hundred by what I could see and count that got into the Capitol. It's, 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 not, it's not a fair judgment. It's not a fair, uh, it's not an accurate description. Sage, I want to invite you to respond to Greg's note, but let me first ask Greg you a question of clarification. Is there a specific reference that you're thinking about when you um, said that that the, you've been labeled a racist and a white supremacist by our new presidential administration? Was there a specific comment or instance that, that you had in mind? Um, I heard... And I have to paraphrase because I can't quote it. And I've since went back and tried to find the links and I'm not successful at finding the links, but I've heard it come out of President Biden's mouth that, uh, and, and of course he's kind of, I think he's careful in how he says it, but he is saying, he has said, right after he talked about uni, unity and uniting, then he came out and, and, and said that uh, this racism that comes from the previous administration has to stop that he says it has to stop well if it has to stop you know racism goes more than one direction and uh, and then i've heard i've heard nancy pelosi i've heard chuck schumer i've heard um i've heard a lot of them and, and especially just in even today nancy pelosi was recorded uh, on tv saying uh, referring to people in congress are the core of this this murder this attempted murder caseo aco i can't remember uh, cortez uh, even AOC Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, Congresswoman. Right. Yeah, and she even wrote a letter to to um, um, Senator Cruz, uh, Ted Cruz, accusing him of being uh, of attempted murder. Him specifically, if if I read the letter right, and I heard her say it. So these things are not going to unite us. Uh, I think too. We have now got a chance, the Republican conservative Christians, we will category, uh, categorize all them into one group right now for this purpose. We have an opportunity that I mentioned online uh, not long ago to, uh, to show how to be a good loser. We lost heavily, we lost big time. You can't lose any bigger than this. You lose the House, the, con the Congress, uh, the Senate and the President. And um, so we've lost. So what we have to do is we have to be an example now and we have to do what we've been asking the other side to do for the whole long, you know, all along for the last eight years at, and four, 12 years to stop burning places down, stop, stop going out and doing this. And then one time, I mean, we've, how many places have been burned down? How many looting, all that type of stuff that happens. This is a, a broad spectrum of things that happens. And now, you know, for whatever reason, now it's our turn to, be the example, to be a light, as I say. Um, and here's the other thing. To be honest with you, I really feel deep inside. We, the people, aren't going to really be able to do this without God. It's going to have to be God's going to have to change hearts. Whether you believe he's the one that changes hearts or not, I believe it. And I'm the one that's stating it. And I believe that it's going to take God or, or, a, or a likeness of God, his love to do this. And, and I always refer to that, that you've been there with me in that Kuyar. And I tell them I, that the, the Bible says to love everyone. And I even tell people, I go back occasionally to see if it's changed and it hasn't, it's still no if, ands, or buts, commas, or semicolon is nothing like that. It's love everyone. And mm -hmm. I try to do that. I try to do that. And I want to, I want to be the example. Yeah. Sage, I'm going to invite you to reflect on uh, what's your response to what Greg wrote and, and what he and what he said? Well, I can't respond to everything Greg just said because it's a lot of information. Um, but I can talk a little bit about my response to the post. Um, 
So I completely understand that Greg is, is upset and his being upset reflects um, a, a lot of other people's feelings as well. It's not specific to you. Um, and and I, I felt like when I read it, maybe at the core of what you were saying uh, was that you were tired of being labeled a, a racist or a white supremacist. Um, and it's, it's unfair and it's inaccurate. And you feel like people are just throwing this label at you without understanding who you really are. And they don't want to know who you are. Um, and it's destructive and it shows lack of good faith in pursuing unity by throwing these labels at people. Um, so th that was sort of like my, my immediate reaction of the pain that I felt you were feeling. Um, and I I understand a lot of that. <laughs> I've been called racist. I know a lot of people who have been. I often feel unfairly. Um, I think that you are right to say that it is a term that is thoughtlessly, cruelly thrown at people, unjustly, maybe. Um, and it's a really complicated word in American history. So uh, I think that people should be careful before they throw that word around at people. Um, I will say when I, I just went back because of this conversation and re-listened to Biden's speech and uh, the places where I heard him talking about race, he talked about unity, of course, throughout the entire speech, but um, he talked about racists in relation to January 6th. Um, and then most of the other times, I, I never heard him speak about the, admin the Trump administration as being racist. I more heard him saying, we have a history of racism in this country that often is in conflict with the goal of unity. And so it's very difficult to pursue unity when we have this extreme division in our society and our desire for racial justice sometimes can conflict with our desire for national unity. So it is a struggle that we are gonna have to confront during the Biden administration if we want to achieve unity or if we want to achieve racial justice, these things are not necessarily aligned and it's going to be a struggle. So I, um, I'd be, I would love to talk with you, Greg, about the word racist, about why I think it's unfair the way that uh, it has been used against you and how liberals and conservatives <laughs> can do better mm -hmm. about using mm -hmm. that word and responding to it. Yes. Greg, you want to respond to that? I just agree with everything she said, and I hope that I uh, I hope that I did say I hope that it was her because I know I said it, but I, I believe the same thing. We have to hold ourselves accountable too, and now we have the chance. We've been in the driver's seat for four years, so uh, and we've been taken. I, how I feel, we've been taken the, the the whipping, you know, of this at uh, Donald Trump because he speaks of one group of. Hispanics or whatever coming across the border, the, the the gang group. He speaks of them, but he um, and and this is on this is recorded too. I even have said too that uh, that I don't like every I don't like the way that Trump says things. Sometimes I, I sometimes I wished I would have. And David, you know this. If I'd ever got the opportunity, I'd have took that job of his Twitter. And and I may not be the best for it but I'd been better than him at it. Uh, there's just some things I, I didn't like the name calling. Um, so, but I I've been known to call it out too on Facebook and in person with people I'm like, yeah, I don't. And on film on, on, uh, in documentaries and stuff, I've made it, made it clear that that is that, you know, but, but his policies is what I clung to. I, I cling to his policies, everything that Donald Trump did for this nation to help the blacks, to help the Hispanic, to help, you know, with employment and to give and make and give parks, designate parks to to honor blacks. Um, Donald Trump's first uh, security guard, if I read correctly, uh, I watched a documentary once. His very first security guard that he ever hired, a bodyguard, however you want to phrase it, was a retired black police sergeant from New York um, Police Department. The very the person that built the woman, the, the person that built Trump Towers, the, the construction management, the leader, the top construction manager was a woman. 
and it was a great thing, you know, and it was a good marriage, I guess, uh, so to speak, uh, until I guess she got fired and then she didn't like him anymore. But but the, the fact remained, he hired her. He hired a woman. So sexist and racist to me just doesn't uh, match the, the, the description that people try to put on. Yeah. So, so Greg, one of the things I wanted to talk about with you is defining terms. So I think one of the reasons why there's a lot of conflict between uh, Republicans and Democrats on this is that when Democrats use the word racist, they mean something completely different than what you mean when you use the word racist. And, and I mean, like we talk in Braver Angels about using loaded words. It's not good to use words where people understand totally different things when they're hearing them or saying them. So this is a really dangerous word. But I think one of the things like a lot of Dem um, Republicans, when they use the word racist or they hear the word, they think it means you, you don't like people of a certain color, you, you actively right. hate them and it has something to do with intent. But a lot of liberals, when they use the word, I think what they generally mean um, is they're talking about a system that has a, an impact disproportionately in their mind on oppressed people or people of color. And of course, you might say your policy is, it, you, you don't agree with that policy analysis, but that is still what I think liberals generally mean. Um, I also, I think that when, when I think of the word racist, um, I am sympathetic to, I found this quote that I feel like expresses what, what I mean by the term um, by Ta-Nehisi Coates, who says racism is not simply hatred, but a broad sympathy to some and skepticism to others. So for me, it's sort of like, who do you focus on? Who do you care the most about? Um, it's not that you actively dislike any groups, but just what, where are your values? Where's your priority? Um, so if your policies tend to be about cutting taxes, um, doesn't mean you hate black people, but your policy is not about specifically um, addressing affordable housing, which might be of more interest to people of color. So a liberal might say you're racist because you don't see this, you don't care, you don't prioritize it. And that's not a good word choice, in my opinion, because when a conservative hears that, that's not what they hear. They hear you believe in lynching or shooting people, or, and that's not what, you're just not speaking or hearing each other. Very interesting. Uh, brings me to this point, and I told David when I discovered it, I think I might have been the first braver angel that discovered Dean Phillips, Congressman Dean Phillips in Minnesota. I uh, just happened to be watching on one of the, uh, the news networks. Um, uh, anyway, it was a hearing uh, about our HUD, Housing Urban Development, and of course, Dr. Carson, is in charge of that under the uh, Trump administration. And the, the Congress was pretty much grilling him about the, his boss, Donald Trump. And, and it just was unpleasant. I thought, this is, we're not getting anywhere in this hearing. It comes down nearly the end of the meeting or the hearing. And uh, Congressman Dean Phillips asked uh, Dr. Carson a question about Donald Trump. And it was really it was, he, he said it in love. You could tell that he just really had a passion and, and care for the country about all this other stuff that was just discussed. What are we going to do? And he said, if you could change anything, and I'm paraphrasing, but uh, if you could do anything differently uh, with the president and, and this, what would you do? And, and you would have thought that Carson had been to one of our uh, workshops for Braver Angels because he said, we just have to stop all the name calling. We have to stop all the, the, we have to introduce love into all this to solve everything. And he basically said the same thing. And I just liked, I'd love to go find that again. I'd like to be able to talk with Dean Phillips about it and let him know how much I really appreciated that being a Trump supporter and a Dr. Carson supporter as well. And just the way he handled that, he went way out of, you know, context of what the others were doing, said something very nice and, and genuinely cared. I could tell he really cared it, you know, and uh, to, to help. And that's a racial issue. I mean, it's, it's, it's a cultural issue. And sometimes I think our problems are more cultural than they are racial uh, because uh, you've, got, you've got some white people that act crazy too, that do crazy stuff, you know, about, uh, you know, how, how they word things and, and the words they use and that N word. God forbid that N word be used, you know, because 
it's used more in rap music than and and, and they say well what well, we end it with a a and not an er i'm sorry it's still the n word stop it and 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 morgan freeman says the same thing it racism maybe not all of it but a lot of it will go away when we, when everybody stops using it and but that's see, how Greg i I think what you're talking about right now is like words that people use, right? So that is that is one manifestation potentially of yeah, racism. But, right. but again, what liberals are thinking about are like policy structures and voting discrimination. Okay. Uh, right? So it's just like, we're looking at different problems and, and seeing different areas. And so when you're saying racism, you're looking at something totally different than what I'm talking about when I say racism. Yeah, so well, let, let's- what we need Go ahead, Go ahead Greg, and then I'm going to ask you another question. All, all I was going to say is I just think that we, this is something that uh, I think it's a huge issue, the Braver Angels, because we are the people, we are the boss, we are, and I call the politicians the kids. They're the ones that are out of line. We need, we're going to, we've said this for a long time in our own alliance, David. Somebody's going to have to teach them people how to behave because they don't on both sides. So, it's yes, and, and we should know Congressman up. Dean Phillips, of whom, uh, Greg, you were speaking. Democrat from Minnesota, uh, a Democrat who you really admire, Greg. And uh, yes, yeah. uh, Congressman Phillips spoke, uh, has spoken now at several Braver Angels gatherings. Um, I want to ask you, and I'll go to you, Sage. You mentioned that, uh, you noted that President Biden said the word and emphasized the theme of unity a lot in his inauguration speech. What do you hope that American unity looks like? Um, you know, it's, it's hard for me to envision right now because everybody feels really divided. I, I feel like my, my images of unity have to do with experiences in my life that I consider to be like what I wish things were like most of the time. So my image of unity uh, would be playing with my band in my former band in Nashville. Um, and I played with a good friend who was a Trump supporter. He was my best friend. Um, and we played music, like classic country honky tonk band that was from um, all over America and across 60 decades, no, like a hundred years of American music. And we would talk about where the music came from and what it meant to us and learn about each other through it and then perform it together. And people would come from all over the country to listen to us because we played at an RV park where people would uh, come on vacation. Um, and sometimes they'd come back every year. And I just felt like we had music was a shared love that we had that held us together, but it was also something out of which we were able to connect at a deeper level and learn from each other, learn about different experiences. And um, that that is what I wish my country was like, but um, that community and my community have become so polarized that we can't have that anymore. Um, and that really hurts me. So I, I hope someday we're all more open to each other and, and willing to listen and play with each other and learn from each other. <laughs> mm. You mean that specific community has not been able to continue because of the, the political yeah. divide? Mm. Craig, what do you hope that American unity looks like? I honestly and sincerely believe, I, I wish the, the America would get back to the JFK party. I do believe that the, the Democrat party has swung farther to the left than what even some Democrats wish it would have gone. I would like to get it back to the two party system that we've always had. You know, the, the Reagan, the Kennedy, even Bill Clinton, although his morals didn't line up with the way I thought they should. He did some. He did some good things. He did things that I could recognize. In, in this day and age, nobody likes anything from the left that, that, that Trump does, and nobody from the right likes anything that they do on the left. And then you got uh, Senator Cruz that tries to step up and 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 reach across the aisle with the person uh, the and Cortez, 
I can never remember her name. I'm sorry. But uh, and then and she shoots him down. So what I would like to see is us to get back, like Sage said, to the, when we were growing up, how things were in the music industry and in all industries, um, in the workplace, in the church, in the home, in the backyard, talking across the fence. So you voted for JFK and and this other guy voted for the uh, Reagan or or Nixon or whoever, you know, was coming along. It's, it's still we we work together. We we work together as America and we America was was number one. For one thing, too, God was number one back then. He's he's slipping on the charts right now. Uh, and that's not that's not good, in my opinion. But I'd love to. And here's what I think. You're going to ask me what I think we ought to do to fix it. <laughs> I'll just get well, I'll get there. I'll get there, Greg. Okay. All right, go ahead. But uh, let me ask you, Sage. So we have there are there are injustices in the country, right? Can you have unity when there is injustice, whether it's racial injustice or other injustice? Can you have unity when there is injustice? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I I was thinking and preparing for this about. Uh, a monument at Yale that I wrote a paper about that's a Civil War monument that was I don't know what year it was from but it was well after the Civil War during um, near World War One, and it's notable because Yale did not mention slavery in the monument it, it mentioned Confederate soldiers and Union soldiers and honored both for their dedication and did not mention slavery even though at the time of the Civil War almost Yaley's fought for the Union specifically against slavery and uh, the people who made the monument were very careful to exclude any mention of racial strife from the monument because they thought it was more important before World War I that the country stay together and that they find ways to cut racial discord from our history so that America could be stronger in the face of its current issues. Um, I think there's a lot of points in American history where we have erased racial injustice in order to pull together for things that we think are more important. Um, and right now might be one of those moments we have a lot of crises facing our country. And so I don't know if Americans think that this is important enough. Um, and it's been a long time that we have not felt it is important enough. So it worries me to, I don't, I don't know if we'll be able to come together um, and support racial justice because I, I haven't seen a lot of evidence of that in the past. Greg, I wanna invite you to respond to that and also ask you because I know that you care a lot about uh, what many would describe as justice for unborn children and you're, you're a passionate pro-life person so let me ask you the same question can unity exist when there is injustice you have to be in the room um i was a police officer and in this day and age there's a lot of police officers that come under scrutiny by the media uh, and the media is the first one that helps to form a an opinion or even a verdict in a lot of these situations that happen with police officers. I stay back and when a cop does something wrong and it's been proven wrong, and, and by the way, justice is not that you find a man guilty. Justice is that he gets a, a fair trial. And so we have to wait until there's a trial where they are judged by their peers. And I think a lot of times, I don't know how often, but a lot of times they, these police officers are judged by a, um, a diverse uh, jury. Uh, and I can't, I can't tell you all the facts about it, but I do know that when it happened, I read and I seen, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm glad that turned out. I'm glad there was a diverse jury. So I do believe it can happen, but you have to be in the room uh, when I would go to a domestic dispute and, uh, and, and you get there and the, the woman is, is that answers the door and you say, where's, where's the husband? And she say, he got in his truck and he went to the bar. He's not here. Uh, then you, or you get there and, and he'd say, where's she at? And she's back in the bedroom and he's in the kitchen and, uh, and you got to get them in the room. You have to get them, you know, get them in the room. You have to bring peace uh, uh, to them. You have to, you have to get her side, his side, bring them in and say, this is a compromise. Can we do this? And for now, if maybe we just separate for now, but we got to get back together. You have to, both people have to want to get together 
in yeah. a marriage. And, and if you don't want to get that together, it's not going to work. You have to have two people want to do it. And here's the victim. The victim is when you look down the hallway, <laughs> it always chokes me up when I think about it because I've seen it so much. And what's going on right now in this country, when you look down the hallway and you got the little children, it's like, and here, here's our, our, our senators and Congress and presidents, and they're all fighting. And we're the ones that have to pay for it. And we, and we should be the ones that they care the most about. They need to start getting together. So if, so if a kid, and then so many times you hear, we're going to stay together because the kids, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna hold, let's do it for the kids. Let's hold this thing together. So we need to get our leaders to say, let's get this together for our kids. It turns out the kids are, are your boss. And that's why I always say, you got to get your kids. Uh, you know, if somebody's out of line, you get, you get, a, get a grip on them. But what I'm saying is, you got to, we got to come in the room. Yes, I do believe it can happen, but it has to be a willful uh, decision on both sides. You have to want to do it. You have to be selfless. And, and again, you know, you just put some love in your heart and just stop hating, stop hating both sides, both sides got to stop hating. And we can do this. I believe, yes, we can do this. If we get in the room, Brave Angel is going to have to be the ones that's going to have to get these people in the room. Greg, you have you had written to me in a text uh, uh, after Biden's inauguration. You learned that if one side doesn't want the union to last, it won't last. It takes two, in this case, red and blue, right? Republican, Democrat. Right. To find the harmony we're looking for, you said. Say right. more about that. I use examples a lot of times yeah, when I'm it, talking. It, you've learned that if one side doesn't want the union to last, it won't last. Yeah. Um, Just well, you're... It, ha it takes two. And, and, and that comes from my experience of working in with the domestic relations of that. Um, and being in, and, and I've been divorced more than once, more than twice. You know, I could, uh, I could go on. But I've learned a lot from that. I've even thought, you know, when it happened, when those divorces were happening, I couldn't figure out. And I was asking God why I, I did. I did my best. I did an absolute best. I was I was a good husband in all those cases in every every case. But but one one, there was a situation that I had to own the responsibility of a divorce. But I had to I'd ask God all the time. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? And now it's come to me. And I think maybe, maybe God was preparing me for this position that I'm in now, because now I feel like if anybody could probably work this out, I can be the guy. And, and along with people like Hope, Rob Weidenfeld, uh, Kuyar, Bill, all of our other, our alliance, you know, we've tried to think, what can we do to get to the politicians to get it? Well, I feel like I could lead this parade. I feel like I can lead this because of my experience and, and my pain and what I've went through. So I can say I've been through the pain uh, like the, the Democrats have been through. And I've been through the pain, going through the pain now with what uh, the Republicans are going through. I've been on both sides of this fence. I've been, I've, I've been the victor and I've been the victim, but I like to claim victory no matter what. Even if I am the victim, I, I, I claim victory because, because uh, God, Jesus is my salvation. And, and I know that if I don't get it done here, then I'm going to heaven someday and I'll leave, pass it on to my kids and grandkids. But I feel like I'm capable of leading this. And that's why Sage, I spoke up. Sage, I want to ask you about this idea of are we headed for have we already had a civic divorce from each other as reds and blues? Are we headed for that? What, what needs to happen in order for us as reds and what do we as reds and blues need to do in order to avoid a civic divorce? What's it going to take? So um, I think I've seen a lot of civic divorces recently. <laughs> so it's definitely happening. Um, I think to answer this question, I'm going to give an illustration that maybe is more hopeful to your also your question of how do we have unity and address racial justice? Because we probably have to answer both of those questions in order to avoid a civic divorce. So your questions probably go together. Um, so in abstract terms, I don't know the answer. There's no easy answer to this question. But I can think of an example from my ideal music community of a moment where I saw how race 
prevented us from being um, a, a unified community and, and excluded people. And I also can imagine how we could have done better and could have fixed the problem and be, been unified. So my example is uh, we were, before we were a honky talk band, we were a bluegrass band and we used to play this song um, about Dixie, you know, like a kind of nostalgic Dixie song. And, um, and then one of the players would improvise on piano during the during a part of the song, like actually, actually the song Dixie, which is a very loaded song, obviously, to play with a lot of history embedded in the music. I played it, for example, at the Smithsonian, but I would talk about that history when I played it. So it's very different if you play it in a room full of only white people. Um, so I am a fiddle player. I don't always pay attention to the politics of what I'm playing. It took me a long time to notice that this was happening. So I, I I, I didn't notice it until one day a black man walked in the room while we were playing, like right before we were gonna play this song. And that was very rare. So people always notice because the room was very white. Um, and then suddenly everybody stopped in the middle of a show, everybody stopped. And the piano player and the guitar player were whispering to each other on stage. It was so embarrassed um, saying, should we play the song? No, we shouldn't play the song. Should we play the song? And then. I get called, don't, we're not gonna play this song, we're gonna do the next song. Really, really embarrassing. So after that, I figured out what, what the song was about. I looked it up, did some research. And I talk, I asked our piano player if I could talk to him about it. And we talked for more than, like we talked for an entire evening, like four hours about the set list and the music and the politics of what we were playing. And I specifically wanted to talk about the song. And I told him, you know, like, I realized that there are very rarely black people who come to our shows. But one reason why they might not come to our shows is because the songs that we're playing are glorifying a period of time when they were enslaved <laughs> and saying, we wish we could go back to this time. Things were better back then. And it's not just for the rare occasion when a black person comes in that I don't wanna be playing these songs. I don't wanna be playing these songs ever. These are not the values that I wanna be promoting and I love this music, but there's lots of great music out there. We don't have to play this song. We could play another great song. And we had a long discussion about this, it was complicated, um, but my piano player agreed not to play it anymore. However, he also told me that whenever I wasn't there, he played it. <laughs> He was only not playing it for my feelings, not because he cared about anybody else's feelings or the values that he was promoting. And also he thought it was funny sometimes when I was distracted to just improvise Dixie on his piano because he knew that it made me upset. So the moral here being that if we actually prioritize, again, I, I think racism comes down to what do we really care about? What do we prioritize? Who's, who do we sympathize with? My band sympathized with me. They, they were willing to change their behavior to include me, but they were not willing to do it for the abstract black person that they didn't really know or to, or to think deeply about what it meant racially and in terms of what our country, what it is to play songs like that. And I, no matter what I did, I couldn't get them to make that important enough that they would sacrifice playing a song that they liked and that was admittedly really fun to play. So they would have had to make a sacrifice to accommodate other people and to think about what type of country they, they wanted to have and they weren't willing to do that. And so that just meant that we never had a space that was open to a lot of people that I, I wish could have been included. Um, mm. And I think as a country, we have to think about like, who do we care about? What sacrifices are we willing to make? Who do, who do we wanna be? And who do we listen to? And whose feelings matter? Um, and unless we're willing to think about that and make those changes to our system, we're not gonna have unity and we're not gonna have racial justice. Mm. Greg, I'll let you respond to that. And also just to the general question of, what will it take for us as reds and blues to avoid a civic divorce with each other? Um, again, uh, I agree with what uh, Sage said, it has to be give and take on both sides. There has to be compromise. Um, and I feel like that the we've, we've done this, we've been through it. I feel like we, we got through the civil rights. I mean, we, the Republicans passed the civil rights bill. Um, Republican president got rid of slavery. So it's been done. We got to stop undoing it. We got to stop undoing what we've done. And we got to go back a few years back and, and pick up where we left off 
And I thought Donald Trump was doing a, an amazing job of at least giving jobs, you know, making jobs available and getting that unemployment rate down for the, uh, the blacks and Hispanics and other, you know, nationalities and races. Um, I just thought everything was really going great. Um, I noticed, um, man, I mean, there was that beer garden thing where, where uh, President Obama made a, made a rush to judgment on a case, on a situation. And then he had to invite the police officers in, the white police officers into the, the White House. And the, if you remember the beer garden, and it was a peace treaty thing, you know, because he had, he rushed to judgment on a, on a situation. We've got to stop. We got to get the, I'll tell you what we got to do. We got to get this media to start reporting news accurately. And if you don't know something, media, say, I don't know, but we're investigating. We will find out and wait for the facts. The media is, and I'm going to come down on him, and Don Daler, God love him from CBS. I've done hit him once, and, and, uh, and he loves me, and I love him. But this is not an echo chamber thing. This is a, a serious issue where the media has got to take a responsibility and stop fueling these fires. Um, I don't know if it's for their ratings or it's for the money or for the power or what it is, but I'm going to tell you right now, the media has got to stop it. Uh, and, uh, and, and Fox is the same. Fox will do the same. I'm not going to jump on the Fox bandwagon. I have my medias that I listen to uh, a little more carefully, but it's, they're usually Christian based. And I feel like if I can't trust them, then can't trust anything. And I always, I trust in God anyway on, on this stuff, but I believe we can do it. I believe that we have to, uh, we have to, again, I go back to, we have to get in the room. We have to come in together with, with the, the care in our heart. I agree with um, Sage on what she's saying. I don't know all the specifics, but I know there's times that um, things aren't set up. But I'll tell you this too. My first big job that I had an opportunity to get when I fresh got out of high school, I went to the union hall. I was going to get in the apprenticeship program and I couldn't get into the apprenticeship program because I wasn't, um, I wasn't, I wasn't black, I wasn't Native American, I wasn't a woman, and I wasn't a veteran. I can appreciate the not being a veteran. I can't appreciate the other things. Um, I think you should be hired on any job according to your, your ability and your qualification, not of any of the other things. And I've got Native American friends and, and and black American friends and, and veteran friends. I've got and female friends. I don't have as many female friends I'd like to have. <laughs> but I'll find one someday. Well, we got to get those. Greg, you know, one of the, uh, one of the, if there were a Braver Angels Hall of Fame and there were like moments and Braver, you were looking at Braver Angels Hall of Fame moments, one of them would be at the second ever Brave Angels workshop, which is the subject of the documentary, the Brave Angels documentary, which you're in, and also your, your famed uh, blue partner, Kuyar. And there's a moment there where you say, you talk about going out there for a tie. Can, can you t tell us what you meant by that? And then I wanna ask you um, what, if you still believe that? So anyway, tell us about that moment, S set that up for us. Uh, the moment was, uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, I feel like God led me to this program in the first place. I feel like God directed me here. And, and again, going back to uh, moments in my life to where things happen, I'm like, I don't really know why that happened, but I do know that this came out of it. So this came out of a, uh, uh, a marriage that did not fare well. It was farewell. But anyway, uh, says you ought to, this sounds like something yeah so i came to braver angels i came to that uh, that workshop thinking this is my chance to maybe change some minds to to set the record straight for people that don't have an understanding those those the this uninformed liberals okay that was my mindset coming in so i i thought this is going to be a good chance to go i had no idea then when i get there and they divided us up and they took us red up into one room and they took the blue into another room. And David Blankenhorn is talking to the blues over there, explaining the ground rules of how this weekend is going to go. And we're getting it from, I think, Bill Doherty at the time. And uh, Peter Yarrow happened to be with our group. But um, I'm listening to the ground rules. 
There's no eye rolling. There's no talking over people. We take turns. All the things basically that we learned as, uh, as, as five-year-olds, kindergartners, where you share and you be courteous and you be civil and you be kind. And we'll get through this and we'll, we'll hear each other's ideas. And you don't accuse, you don't label. All these things are coming around. I'm like, well, this sounds like something that, that we don't want to win at all. But the winning comes in a tie. And I, I just asked, I said, so all the years, and of course I used the, the scenario that I worked for the Cincinnati Bengals for several years. And, uh, and, and I heard a lot of victory speeches from uh, multiple coaches and, uh, and, and, and pregame speeches and all that, you know, rah, rah stuff. And let's get out there and, and kick some butt. Let's go out there and win this thing. And here I am listening to the story of, of the ground rules for this. It's like, we're not out to win this. We just want to tie. And the win is a tie. It's the only case I know where we can win if we tie, if we can come to an agreement. And I love the, better, the Braver Angel uh, debates, how they work. They don't work to win. They work to resolve. And I love that. Greg, you said those words in April 2017. President Trump had just been elected. Do you still believe that, that we got to go out there and get a tie? I do believe that. I do believe that. Um, and take away the way he said things and just, uh, and just look at the way he did things. He did accomplish things. I feel like Donald Trump accomplished a lot for the, for the country. He, did, he brought jobs back from other countries. He, he's, he's, he's picking and choosing who comes to this country the way it's always been. We just let, we've never, back in the day, we never just let, when we, when, when our forefathers and everybody was coming here, you just didn't let anybody in. You had to make sure that the, the good people were coming in. If you're bad, you went to prison or you, I don't know, you didn't get the boat or whatever, but we've got to, uh, again, we got to, we've got to work toward a tie and we got to call that a win. Yes. I, I feel like uh, president Trump was making good, but like I said, the way he says things sometimes is just kind of crass, but he's not a politician. He's a businessman. And that's how you get business. You treat business like business. And he treated this politician's world like a business and he was successful at it. Sage, I want to ask you a tie. You got to go out there and get a tie. Um, personally, I think that's kind of, maybe in a different sense where we are right now. I know that Democrats won, but we have a split government in many ways. So we're gonna have to work together to do anything and we better do something right now because we need to be doing something. There's too many problems Amen. to do nothing. Um, Democrats may have the presidency, but personally I definitely see Biden as a moderate. Almost all the liberals I know did not support him because they're more leftist than he has ever been. Um, he is pretty moderate. Senate is 50-50. 51-50 is not a huge difference in terms of any major changes um, the House the Democrats have, and then the courts the Republicans have. So I, we better learn to work together. Um, and I think that we all should want that because we all want to fix problems. And unless we seek a tie, we're going to have nothing. So, yeah. No. So David, I'll say something to that. Go for it, Greg. So we agree. Uh, I can agree with Sage. I can come in to the middle a little bit more and say, I agree with her. We are at a tie. She made good points right there. So now what we have to do is learn to live with the tie. Yeah. We have a tie. Let's learn to live with it. Let's learn to live with it. Let's accept the tie. And when it comes time for the Super Bowl, we'll play each other again. Two years. <laughs> <laughs> and and in the meantime, and I think this is the way that I see it, uh, is that we work to it. We work on the common ground where there's common ground. We listen to each other. We acknowledge the differences. And I think, as one of you said, this isn't just a. This isn't just a. We don't have the luxury of. This isn't just a team sport. Ha ha. Right. There are real issues real. for right. all of us. There are issues right. of justice, of, of what's right and what's wrong. Um, there are for all of us. Those are at play here. And so it's not that we're just like, oh, you know, let's let's go out there and you know, and we're going to have our differences. We are working. 
for what we believe is right and just. And at the same time, we're keeping the conversation going with each other as we're doing here. Because if we're if we can't share the space with each other, then what does that lead to? If we can't share the country with each other, where does that lead to? Ah. So, um, well, listen, I'm really grateful to both of you for uh, taking the time for this conversation, and I know that I know that there are a lot of questions right now about. You know, there's a lot on the one hand. There's a lot of optimism. There's a lot of hope about about uh, unity and about those themes and about hearing it from President Biden. On the other hand, there's a lot of skepticism and, and questions about uh, you know, how inclusive is that vision of unity and is it really possible? And maybe even some cynicism about the notion. So we're entering, a, we're entering an, an important period here, but I'm glad that I think there's trust among us, among um, age, Greg, myself, at least enough trust for us to get in the room together here right. and to listen to each other. And so I'm grateful. Uh, I want to ask if there's any final words that, that you want to say, and uh, I'll start with you, Greg. Music heals the heart in all kinds of ways. Music, different music, different artists, different music, but music is a healer for people. Um, a lot of people go to song. I know I go to it all the time. Uh, and I have, I'm a fan of all different kinds of artists. I guess, I don't know, is Garth Brooks a liberal? I don't know. And I don't care. He divorced a woman that I thought was a great wife and all that kind of stuff. But, and I didn't like it, but I stayed a fan of Garth Brooks for his music, for his music and his attitude of music. And the things I taught Ronnie Lynn, some things that I learned from Garth Brooks. Garth Brooks says, that uh, when he sings, he sings to the back row. Well, that's a good thing because I had the back row a couple of times. But uh, I've seen him seven times in concert. Uh, an amazing entertainer, and his, and his band is great. So there's Garth. Let's call him a liberal for a minute, um, just for the minute. I don't know if he is or not, but uh, some people tell me he is, and they ask me, you still like him? I said, well, yeah, yeah, I'd still go to his show, you know. Uh, so let's, let's have a concert then. Let's have Garth Brooks on the stage. And of course, we got to have Sage and Ronnie Lynn on the stage. Let's get Garth Brooks and say, um, let's get Ted Nugent on the stage. And let's have a concert. And we have Ted and Garth singing together. Let's get a big, we, we've had a big show. We had the big show, uh, the big event. Let's have the biggest event. And we're always, our musicians are always coming together to do something for somebody, feed the hungry, feed the farmers, feed this. What we let's feed the nation. Let's feed the nation, and uh, and let's get. Let's just try. Let's just. You know, we got Peter Yarrow on our team. We can we can do something like this. We surely can get a big event and bring all the bring bring the bring the blacks on the stage. What they sing together all the time anyway. They sing together all the time anyway. You got the the. You got white people backing up black people lead singers. You got black people backing up white people singers. You got Michael Jackson that, that outsells anybody. You got the Beatles that sell. They're not even American. They're from England. And, but, uh, you know, you got, we've got this, we've got this, uh, this tool right here in this country of all these. And so let's get our bands. Let's get these people to stop fighting. That's a pot. That's a thought. I just had that thought when I was listening to Sage. I'm like, why don't we get these people together? John Legend, he's, uh, I think, left. I love his music. He's amazing. I love the music of artists. I don't know if they're, I don't know what side they're on because it doesn't matter because their music is beautiful and mm. music heals. Music can heal this nation. We It feeds people. It surely can heal hearts. They do it all the time. Let's get them together. Heal hearts, feed the nation. Sage, what are your final words? Well, first, Greg, we're working on stuff like that in the music team. So hopefully in the near future. Um, I'll just end with some quotes that I, I feel like support. Uh, David, laugh what you were saying. Uh, Without unity, there is no progress. I think unity, this is a quote I think Greg would believe in. We can't have racial justice without unity can't have anything, any of the issues that we care about if we don't work together. Biden, of course, said this. This was the theme of his speech. Without unity, there is no progress. 
and in the work ahead of us, we're going to need each other. I'm really um, excited to have a president who made that the core message of his start, and, and I hope we all live up to it as Americans. Mm. Well, thank you uh, so much to you both for your bravery and coming on and sharing your heart, your passion, your feelings, the things on your heart and mind about our country. Thank you so much. And we welcome listeners, we welcome your feedback, whether you're red, blue, other, send us an email at media at braverangels.org, media at braverangels.org. What did you think about this conversation? We take compliments, criticisms and questions, all of it. We want to keep the conversation going. And if you believe in what we're doing at Braver Angels, become a member if you're not already. Go to braverangels.org and click support us and join Sage and Greg and thousands of other Americans in building a house united. So that's all for today. Until next time, let's go out there and get a tie. How's Sage feel now? We still talk to me? I love you, Sage. <laughs>